Good evening again. I'm Persephone McDaniels, and I teach at Jackson State University, and I'll be facilitating this afternoon. And I'd like to thank those who were involved in inviting me to come here and do so tonight. I am very honored, um, and I think we're going to have a wonderful conversation. So I'll say to you, welcome to an evening with Representative Robert G. Clark, Jr. and Dr. John A. Peoples, Jr. And let's just start the night off with a nice applause because that's how I feel like tonight is going to be. Yeah. Before I introduce um, our speaking guest this afternoon, we have greetings by Mr. Brandon Taylor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Jacopo Center. Like she said, my name is Brandon Taylor. I am a graduate assistant here at the COFO, which is now under the name of Fannie Lou Hamer at COFO. We are under the leadership of Mr. McMillan. He's our interim director. We have our education director, Mr. Rico Chet, Dr. Rico Chetton, excuse me, and Mrs. Precious Vine, who's also a graduate assistant here at the COFO. We would like, we would hope that you participate in all our events here during the week of our second annual Black History Makers Week. And once again, thanks for coming to the COFO. Thank you, Brandon. You all made him nervous. <laughs> but you didn't see Precious in the back. She's doing her way. Let <laughs> me say a little bit about our guest for this evening. Um, we were, you have a synopsis that I think you've been seeing along the way because Keith is very good about advertising, isn't he? He started early and he makes sure that you don't forget. But just to remind you, the past of Representative Robert Clark and Dr. John Peoples crossed in 1948 on the campus of our dear old college home, then Jackson State College. Both were scholar athletes and student leaders. Representative Clark was the first Jackson State student to be awarded a track scholarship. And Dr. Peoples played what? Anybody know what sport? He played football, and his position was what? Split in. Split in. These two distinguished. You said what now? On the track team also. Oh, he said he was also on the track team. Okay. Um, both of these distinguished Jackson State graduates went on to achieve a number of firsts in their long careers. Representative Clark became the first African American elected to the Mississippi House of Representatives since Reconstruction. He was also the first black person to chair a committee, and that committee was the what committee? Anybody know? Education. Education. There are a few people there. You see, I'm going to be quizzing tonight. I'm going to answers. And Dr. John A. Peoples was the first graduate to serve as president of, and I know nobody can miss this. Okay, just checking. But you may not know that he was also the first Jackson State graduate to receive a doctorate from the University of Chicago. Representative Clark and Dr. Peoples will discuss their careers tonight and the impact Jackson State had on their lives. They will also discuss the current issues of the future of higher education in Mississippi and Mississippi politics. And I have some questions tonight, but I'll, I'll start by allowing them to come up and having some opening remarks. And then feel free to make sure that I notice you for your questions as well. But we're just going to take um, advantage of them imparting their knowledge tonight. And I hope that you take away something that you didn't come here with. Uh, let's welcome them to the podium. That's going to be Representative Clark and Dr. Peter. Thing about Bob uh, on the track team, you know, the, the mileage had been. 
and trot just trot it along, you know. Bob would lap them. As soon as came in, he started running, just ran around the track, lapping guys. He was just running guys running on if you don't if you don't ask me, I won't answer. <laughs> 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 Newspaper that cause. 
of course, we at Jackson State basically every alumnus to support this man. Now, uh, he's a Brenda Smith, as some people don't know, maybe some people do know, uh, the, uh, the mean white people up there broke her. They stopped advertising her paper, and she just about went broke, supporting Robert Clark. But he did prevail in the government legislature. But old, later on, we'll get on that later, uh, he was the only black in the state legislature. And uh, when he first got on, I was going to talk about this, but he tried to go with all kinds of crazy bills that would never have a chance of passing. But uh, anyway, it put up on him. But he later on, with his uh, skill, uh, made some friends and began to uh, get some important stuff passed. And he was always from Jackson State. He was the one when he became a buddy of his uh, man and moving around and telling about the fact that he became like a speaker for him just about, I think that's the name of it. Yeah. So uh, and that's when he really had some power to do things for the black institutions, in particular in Jackson State. So let, let's don't forget about that place. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I just started to mention that. Before I ran for the legislature, really what aroused me is to do something other than what I was doing. When I saw the crowd led the headline, uh, Dr. John R. People was appointed president of Jackson State University. And that kind of, you know, aroused me to want to do something other than what I'm doing. So that hospital led to me running for the Mississippi House of Representatives. Um, I am a facilitator. You figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not running anything. Um, but I'll start with just a couple of questions um, in the Jackson State era, and then we'll move into some professional questions as well. And, and that's just to, we have some students here, so to give them some background on you as well. Right now, Jackson State, one of our well-known advertisements that people go around reciting all the time, part of our brand is, I chose what? Yeah, what choose Jackson State because what? I did. I did. So one of the first questions is, why did you choose Jackson State? Well, my high school principal uh, referred me to Jackson State. Uh, I was in, in the Marine Corps, and uh, a lot of part of my being there, I was a, became a regular tech. I went to uh, Camp Pendleton, where I uh, spent about 10 months to come in radio tech. I wanted to be an engineer. And so, uh, at any rate, uh, it turned out that my high school transcript couldn't show what I really knew. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I had all that great training. I knew I do all kinds of stuff with radios, with radios for <coughs> an airplane or something, but I couldn't prove it except I had a certificate <laughs> with no transcript. <coughs> I applied to MIT and Caltech and said, well, you don't have any physics. You don't have any foreign language. Ever. Or to try later. So my principal said, go, go around to Jackson State, Dean Samson will take care of you. And so uh, I came to Jackson State. But my principal that summer didn't have a secretary. He made out this transcript and ink. <laughs> <laughs> and all these, all these uh, they use a uh, uh, march, uh, number march, all these 98s and 100s, 98s and 100. And Dean couldn't believe it because he's a, a young man. Uh, Look like this transcript, uh, which might not be correct. I see a little bit of smudge here and there. So he didn't admit me. And I started to transfer to Tougaloo, really. Uh, but uh, he called Stark when he talked to Professor Emerson, and uh, he said, Those are the legitimate grades. So I stayed at Jackson State. So that's why I got the, I couldn't get to uh, Carol Tech and MIT. <laughs> 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 Yes. Uh, my principal and his wife also were graduates of Jackson College. Uh, but when I graduated from high school, I knew I wanted to go to college, but uh, I wasn't sold on what school I wanted to attend. My uncle was my vocational education teacher. Some of my folk uh, before me had attended all home, and he was an overnight, but uh, although I lived on a farm, and I still live on that same farm, <laughs> but I knew I didn't want farming for a living. <laughs> and that I made it off on, say, off on state. And I had some of my family who had gone to Russ, one of my aunts who loved me very much and always called me her boy. And uh, I was interested in Russ. And my father and one of my uncles had attended Jackson State, uh, Jackson College at the time. 
Uh, but I think really what led me to come to Jackson College was that Dr. Joseph Jackson, who was then president of the National Baptist Convention and was the pastor of Olivet, Olivet Baptist Church in Chicago, Illinois, uh, lived at Clarksdale, Mississippi, and he was a graduate of Jackson College. And I really think that had more bearing on why I came to Jackson College rather than going to one of the other institutions. Uh, and uh, uh, he was known as an outstanding historian, uh, and he was great in the eyesights of America, uh, both, both black and white. And I think that was the main reason that I came to Jackson College. <laughs> It was Jackson College for Negro Teachers. <laughs> That's right. For <laughs> <Both> Negro Teachers. <laughs> and uh, as a matter of fact, it had the Mississippi Negro Training School. When the state took it over, it had been Jackson College as a Baptist school. Uh, and <coughs> then it was uh, able to get the, uh, the state to take it over. So, uh, of course, uh, then the, uh, it didn't have enough <coughs> this power to stay president. So, when the uh, Rosen Wall gave some money, gave more than the state gave, the state cut it back to two years. They brought in this, this young man, J.P.R. Reddick's, and uh, Dandy was moved aside to be the registrar. But, um, but Reddick's had enough, I say, political knowledge or skill, I guess, to have it within four years, moved back up to Jackson College for Negro teachers. But it was Mississippi Negro Training School to train rural Negro teachers, you know. But um, that's another story. <laughs> and, and basically, the understanding, you know, when it was the under the direction of the Baptist Baptists of Mississippi, uh, that it was basically for the training of ministers. And the Church College Hill, that they call that's the name of College Hill, that was basically where the ministers got their training. <laughs> like where you go and do uh, a student teaching now, but that's why they got that training at that time at college here. But you were saying it was, it was once Natchez College uh, uh, on the Gulf Coast, and uh, they, they moved to Jackson on the Millsap site, and the people in that area didn't like it, so they had to move out and temporarily at, um, at the church before it came over here. Uh, but it, it, it was Natchez College, and, and the, the Millsap site is, is um, they sold the, the land to a major Millsap, who had a boys' school there at first. <coughs> um, we're often talking about how students have changed, that they're not like they used to be, and so forth. And not that that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, but I'd like you to talk a little bit about what the learning environment at Jackson State was like when you were a student. As an undergrad. Yeah. Well, uh, when I was still in Jackson State, uh, I remember when we got our freshman class, we made headlines, first class, uh, with an enrollment of nine students. I think our highest enrollment when I was here was uh, 315. Mm -hmm. But when we got this freshman class of nine students, uh, we were somebody. Uh, but during that time, uh, you have a student body where every student knew the other student by first name. Uh, and it was a thing more or less like uh, a home environment. It was a thing where the instructors care about you just like your mother and father. And that helped me to adopt to uh, Jackson College very easy uh, because I saw that the instructors uh, had the same, felt like the same affection for me uh, that my mother and father had for me back home. But we were not all just, say, good, nice people. We did some things too, you know. We, you know, they had like, these strict rules for boys and girls. You know, girls could ride in cars and had a curfew for girls at 9 o'clock and all that kind of stuff. But we got around that. <laughs> <laughs> Right 
go to uh, the high school uh, next class to try to pass the GED. So I, I, I told Matt that was my job. Uh, when I got my the truck scholarship, uh, it was, you know, you, you had to work to push the quarters. I tracked it in the spring of the year, so the spring quarter, I did not have to work. Uh, but the job that I had was removing the trash every morning from Barrett Hall, where the freshman and sophomore ladies stayed, and Al's Hall, where the junior and senior ladies stayed. And uh, when I would go on the hall, uh, I was required to say, main on the hall, main on the hall. When I go on the uh, hall floor and say, main on the hall, you would see the freshmen and, and the sophomores, they'd get quiet and they would have here. But when you go to an ass hall and say, main on the hall, you hear some boys that say, who cares? <laughs>
dropped out my senior year at the end of the second quarter. Uh, that was at Christmas. Uh, and my first teacher <clears throat> was back home at the Holmes County Training School at Durant where I had finished high school. Well, when I went back home to teach there, I'm teaching uh, uh, young men that I played with, uh, you know, they were smaller than I was at the time, on the basketball court and on the playground and etc. And uh, I said, and my trustee wanted to have me back, but I said, no way, I'm going to come back here to Durant and try to teach these fellows that I have played when we've been in the alley together and everywhere else. So my first real teacher experience, other than back home at Durant, uh, was at Luke East, uh, Mississippi, in Humphreys County. Uh, but what I did, uh, I looked at all the programs and I pursued and I figured out my quickest way out. I came back to school both uh, semesters of both quarters of the summer. Uh, that's in 52 when I was supposed to graduate. Then I went over to Louis and I taught school. I did my student teaching and I did one uh, quarter in the summer of 53. My class was the class of 52, but actually I graduated in 1953. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to talk about my teacher experience. My father was at the Atlanta Page of my master's degree in New Chicago. Uh, I started applying, started applying for jobs. So I had offers at, uh, at Cincinnati, Ohio, and, uh, and uh, Asabina, California, and uh, uh, it's the school in uh, North Carolina. I'm not in, in uh, it's, it's uh, AP. Uh, yeah, but I'm not thinking about it. Open Arkansas. Arkansas, where you've been in. It's not. Yeah, it's a changed name now. Yeah, it's right. It's changed name teacher there, so um, he said, I'd like you to go to Gary Allen. So I applied for Gary Allen, but they said they didn't have any high school um, vacancies. So um, he, he wrote to a supervisor, Mrs. Ms. Ables, and she called me and she said, look, uh, if you would agree to teach uh, uh, elementary and, and junior high, we're going to hire you and you can move you to high school next year or so. And I took that. So I went over to Gary. But, uh, I knew a lot of math, but I didn't know how to keep on. <laughs> my class was noisy. <laughs> and I'd be teaching with you, just be noisy. And, and um, I tried to be nice. I said, um, uh, well, could you young men and women uh, uh, tell us what you did uh, this summer while I checked cold? But somebody said, the guy said, well, so and so was drinking wine all the summer. <laughs> Man, the one drinking wine. And I think so going to fight. So uh, it took me a little while. So one of the white teachers said, John, you don't have to get your glove here. What do I do? You know, I think all the clippings out there. Can you take him in that closet and shake him through it? <laughs> and I said, Well, you can do that. And I said, okay. The next day, a guy came in there and threw a spinning top on the floor. You know. I grabbed this guy, took him inside there, that closet, and banged him against the wall. And so they all got five. <laughs> <laughs> and the last came and said, Mr. Peoples, is you don't got me? <laughs> anyway, I'll be making my favorite because I'm really the you know, first black high school teacher at Playboy High School, which is the kind of German community. And, and, but it was changing um, to uh, it was about 50% black and it became all black eventually. But um, I'm the first black teacher there. So the kids were there like me, both white and black. It had uh, uh, blacks, Puerto Ricans, and uh, Mexicans, as well as uh, a lot of uh, whites from uh, Russia and Poland, Poland and all like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I did well there, and um, eventually became a principal. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Peoples, but after working in the great state of Indiana, what what made you decide to return to the city? Well, President Reddish kept courting me. You know? <laughs> he, he had friends up there, he had lived there. So 
So every time they came up, um, he would call me and we'd go out to lunch, and he would write me and tell me about the great things he doing in the Jackson State. And we always came back to, uh, about every couple of years on, on vacation, and he had told people, if you see uh, Mr. Peoples at the time, he should let me know. So uh, I, I would let him know I'm, I was here, and he, we would talk about coming back to Jackson State. But at the time when I got a PhD, and he you know, really became serious, and the way I got the PhD, I was teaching a math class, math at Freeville, but at, at about 4 o'clock, I would take off and drive to New Chicago three times, three nights a week, and then on Saturday mornings. And so, uh, uh, but then, uh, you know, master's 51, PhD 61. It took me 10 years, but I mean, I, I kept on at it until I finally got it. But at that time, he just had to have me come back. But the bad time is that they had uh, rides down here and they had power, the president of Alcorn, you know, for having letting the kids demonstrate down there. If you want me to come back and be the dean of students, I said, mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 you know, because I, I, I would kind of identify with the kids, you know, there's no way for me to do that. I said, uh, but if I come back, I'll, have, I'll report only to you, but not as being a student. Mm -hmm. So we kept on after me, and finally, uh, uh, he had me come down to, to uh, meet the college board. And uh, I said, uh, sir, and madam, I said, uh, if I come back to Jackson State, I'm going to try to make it serve, have it developed to serve all the people. Mm -hmm. Well, doctor, that could happen someday, but I mean, you know, right now, <coughs> we can talk to it. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so uh, I did come back, but British Thomas said, look, don't say anything about something in life, man. Smoke the life member in the WCP. I got all my little, little records. But uh, anyway, I, I came back to Jackson State uh, as vice president uh, of Jackson State. And frankly, uh, I could have gone other places, but this was a place where there was something to be done. Uh, I had played football against the Evans boys who were at Auckland when I was there. And Aaron Henry was a good friend of mine. Who, we were both student leaders, even at Xavier, went out to Jackson State, and we had these national student meetings outside of Aaron Henry. And so uh, these guys have gone back to the end of the time to change things. Here I am up here in Indiana, just teaching and not doing anything with it. So I came back and related to those guys I knew, uh, who were still down here fighting a good fight. That's how I was talking about. Representative Clark, after so many years of teaching and coaching, what made you decide to go into politics? Well, it, it's, it's a kind of a, a roundabout way. Uh, for example, <coughs> the first teaching job that I had not at the high school where I graduated from mm -hmm. was at the Hunters County Training School at Louisville, Mississippi. Uh, at that school, we had an eight-month school, but the first two months was probably a half day until cotton got out of the <laughs> Then you went to school full time. And then if the weather broke off early in the spring, when the uh, cotton got large enough to chop, then we went back to the half day. <coughs> but the people in Humphrey County, Louis, Midnight, and Silver City, and Anchorage Club, and etc., some of the best people in the world. They, they, they are just people that will just bring you to them. So I had Fully back in Bonn, where there's a lot of homes kind of movies and the most great people. And I was not intending to go in a place. This is why I was going to make my own go fill my house there. And then the time, uh, you know, the philosophy of immigration came about, and I'm sitting around at uptown, at the little, uh, two or three little stones uptown talking, and I'm saying, yes, it's all right for black and white children to go to school together. Uh, and one day, the superintendent sent a couple of bells on me to his office. So I went to his office, so yes, sir, Superintendent Brown, and he understand you want to see me. He said, yes, I do. He said, I heard that you said it would be all right for black children, white children to go to school here. I said, yes, sir, Mr. Brown, I said that. And I went on to explain to him, that yes, and I think the white parents would tell that children it's all right, uh, and the black parents would do the same thing. And he said, and you absolutely believe that. Yes, sir, I do. And 
and he jumped up like a wall had stone, but some grapple had a foot on and walked out of the office and left me sitting there. And so then after I realized he was gone, <laughs> I got in my car and went on back to Louisville, Mississippi. But lo and behold, at the end of the school journey, uh, I got a message from Sue Teller Brown that you are no longer needed in the school system. Mm -hmm. All right, I had a you know, wonderful relationship with the parents, the students, and everything. And most of all, I had a heck of a basketball and a track team. I had one student who, out, who went on to lead the nation and scoring that year, mm -hmm. and I think he may still hold the record for a student uh, 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 scoring in, in high school. Uh, but then I had, of all instances, I had uh, one minister. Uh, he wasn't a pastor minister, but he didn't mind using the cuss words. And I had another individual fan who was very quiet and never holler said a word. And then another kind of vocal fan, the three came to me. And this vocal fan said, and these words that I'm going to tell you what he said. He said, you don't have to go any place. He said, you're not teaching a DM one of these folk children. And you don't have to go no place. And I said, yes, sir, if the man doesn't want me, I'm leaving. So I left. And as I looked back over it, I saw other African Americans who stayed there. I saw some of them being put in the lake and set on fire and being shot and etc. Then later, when I got to the legislature, and I had a chance to go through the Sovereignty Commission file, I saw where my superintendent at that time had reported to the Sovereignty Commission. So at that time, every superintendent in the state of Mississippi had to report to the Sovereignty Commission. And my superintendent reported to the Sovereignty Commission that I have gotten rid of all of those troublemakers. Mm. And I'm proud that he got rid of me that way. Rather than staying on that let the people get rid of me that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, Clark, you know, you were the Mississippi Senate Minority Caucus from 1967 to 2003. For those of you who did not know that. Um, and 10 of those years, you were the chairperson of the Education Committee. Um, would you talk some, just some about, somewhat about the highlights? Of, of your career while you were in the Yes, sir, and, and I'll be very brief. After uh, running a very hard uh campaign, I won a somewhat of a close election. Uh, how I really got there, I had no idea of uh, a running for the Mississippi legislature. But that's when the legislature passed the law that any school district could have an adult education program if they uh, so desired. And all they had to do last one. I went to, went to the superintendent's office and I asked him if he would have an adult education program. He said, no, I don't believe it's in the best interest of the folk of Holmes County for us to have an adult education program. I want an adult education program because being a coach uh, and having to be in and out of the parent home Many parents was not able to help their students, uh, their children with their lesson. And they told me, we, uh, they told me, I'm sending my child, children to school to you, and I want you to help them. Said, I don't want them to be like I am. Many parents told me, uh, I can't read and write, uh, uh, but I will make them put their heads in the book. So that's why I wanted an adult education program. So then I asked him, the superintendent, uh, well, can I come before the board of education? I said, for uh, an adult education program. He said, yes, you may come, but don't bring a role with you. <laughs> so I carried with me the uh, social science instructor from uh, Chula Attendance Center. That's what the world is. And I also carried the social science instructor from the Durant Attendance Center. And we went before the board of education and asked for an adult education program. And the uh, chairman of the Board of Education, after he gave out a uh, presentation, uh, he says that we will have an adult education program uh, when the superintendent asks for one. Mm -hmm. I said, you mean if the superintendent asks for an adult education program, you will 
allow one to come into Holmes County? He said, yes, that's right. I, said, I had not thought about that at all. But I said, instantly, uh, you will have one next year because I am the clown by county. <laughs> have later ruled this unconstitutional, where you could introduce local and private legislation mm -hmm. that would not speak to anything but that, that particular county. For example, the legislation said this, uh, any county where Highway 17 and Highway 12 intersect, they, the Board of Education may appoint their superintendent of education if they so desire. But there was not one place in Mississippi where Highway 17 and Highway 12 intersected at the capital seat. And that was Lexington, Mississippi. And that meant I could not run for Holmes County Superintendent of Education. So due to the fact that I could not run for Holmes County Superintendent of Education, then I in turn declared my candidacy against those who introduced the legislation to make it impossible for me to run for the superintendent of education. And that's how I got elected. Then after getting elected, I had to go through two lawsuits. Uh, one was, uh, for example, the individual was contested my election. Uh, we were not Democrats. Uh, we could not be Republicans. So we could not be member uh, of the Democratic Party at that time. So I had to run as an independent. In order to get on the ballot as an independent, you had to have 50 signatures. But uh, my opponent that I defeated, he was a plantation owner uh, out from Chula, Mississippi. And he was saying uh, he has have watched the name of an individual and I know he cannot read and write because he lives on my plantation. But what he did not know, uh, since I had been relieved of my responsibilities, my duties, uh, at McClay at the Lexington, uh, because I was going to run for superintendent of education, uh, but what he didn't know, when I was hired at Saints Junior College, that was the college, and the high school was Saints Industrial, that Dr. Arena C. Mallory, the president of Saints Junior College, had an adult education program that was funded by the federal government. And there were 300 enrolling adults getting paid $30 a week to attend the program, educational program, five nights per week, and come back on Saturday for vocational education program. And Dr. Mallory hired me at Saints, and she also appointed me director of the adult education program. The same thing that I wanted, God moved me to do that. So after that really was different uh, in me being elected and not being elected, uh, because those parents, those adults, uh, knew that I was a fair and just person. For example, you know, they had old cars, had bad ties. Sometimes they would, you know, they put the full day up in the field, come out of the field at 4 o'clock, and then have to be on the campus at St. Junior College at 5 o'clock. Sometimes the ties would blow out, and they would get to school, and uh, they would be uh, in that hot dust. Sometimes they would be muddy, not dusty, sweating and trying to fix that flat. And I had the instructions not to penalize any of them if they have car problems when they get to school. And as a result, those individuals learned me and learned to trust me. Uh, and they were a part of the frameworks of my campaign, along with the Freedom Democratic Party, which was a very strong party in Holmes County of black individuals. And after being elected and going through all of those challenges, I didn't know until 10 minutes before I was seated, if I would be seated or not. Uh, it was uh, 10 minutes before uh, when they, when someone from the legislature informed Marion Wright, who was one of my attorneys, that I would be seated. But at the meantime, uh, Aaron, Dr. Aaron Henry from Clarksdale, 
Uh, he was planning to lead a march on the capital from the Delta. Uh, Charles Evans was intending to lead one from southwest Mississippi on the capital. And uh, Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer and her group had already <coughs> arrived at the capital, uh, ready to march. So after I was seated, went in, and was sworn in, and Mrs. Hamer was waiting at the door when I came out. And she said, young man, uh, she directed her hand at my nostril. She says, I had led a march down here to march on them four if they had not seated you. Mm. So now they have seated you. Now you go in there and you vote wrong, I'm going to lead a march on you. <laughs> my tenure, in my tenure being an elected official, and my tenure as other African Americans get elected to the Mississippi legislature. Not all of them. Some of them were great legislators. Great. The majority of them. But there were some that were set there that needed to be marched on. And uh, we had a wonderful time there because I was an educator. I knew that I was an educator. And I was in politics for 30 plus years, but I knew I'm not a politician. I went there as a statesman. I went there knowing that no one in the legislature knew more about education than I did. And I was an education expert, and that's what I stood and I spoke to and spoke for. I knew what I was talking about, and I did not have to ask anyone. Uh, but I, it was very difficult for me to get recognition on the floor of the House. If you get recognition, you use the stand. And following somewhat the Robert rules of order, uh, you're taken in the order in which you come uh, for uh, being recognized. Uh, but the Speaker of the House, or the Speaker pro tempore, whomsoever is presiding, it is up to him and his mind or whomever he sees to decide who is next. But when five or six are standing, then just before it would get to me, then somebody will stand and make a mo motion for the previous question. The previous question means that that cut off debate. And I have been trying to get the floor of the house, trying for maybe a couple of weeks. And just before it get to me, someone will rise, make a motion, move the previous question. Then the previous question means no more debate. debate. You've got to take that vote. So on this particular night, when it got near me, someone made that motion. But well, God in heaven knows I had had enough. I got up and I cleaned my desk out and I walked out the legislature, walking to my car. Bill Minor, most of you know him, I know who he is, and Butch Lambert, uh, who was a legislator uh, from Tupelo. Uh, they came to me trying to get in my way, trying to stop me. I was just, you know, upset because I had extra strength. Just threw my arm, pushed them out of my way. And uh, when I got to my car, and I reached out to unlock my car, Bill Miner said to me, he said, Clyde, they're up there laughing at you. you they're, you're doing what they want you to do. And when Bill Miner said that, my hand dropped. And I turned around, and I went back to the floor of the house. And when I walked back to the floor of the house and I opened the door, oh, they were having a party. They were throwing caps and everything in the air. They were wolf whistling and doing everything. But when I walked back in, it got just as quiet as a mouth. So uh, that was one high point in my career, the first high point, knowing that I can conquer them. And naturally, when I went to the legislature, I was an education legislator. I had introduced all kinds of legislation. And when Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated, I went to his funeral. While I was at his field, that legislation was called up. While I was at his field, all that legislation was killed in the committee. And I did not get a chance to pursue it in a fall. Uh, and I constantly introduced the legislation. And the next year, when I introduced it, um, the, the, the falls and the against was about even. Uh, but what the individuals would do that's against the legislation, uh, they would get up and they would walk out. Enough of them would walk out. So we wouldn't have a quarrel. And we couldn't take the education legislation up. 
It was basically the reform legislation that we eventually got passed in 1982 after Governor William Wong uh, became governor. Uh, they would walk out so we wouldn't have a quorum. But what I did, I had some legislators, some uh, from down in uh, South uh, Mississippi, uh, some from some parts of the Delta, Yazoo City, some from Greenville, uh, some from Baltimore County. Uh, then I would, would have some of our legislators to leave and go to the club, or go to the bathroom, go somewhere and hide out. And when they would count and they get up and walk out, then I'd go to the door and knock on the bathroom door and knock on the closet door and come back. And when they came back in and that particular day, we had a quarrel. And I made a motion that we would move those bills to the top of the calendar for immediate consideration. So the Chamber of Education Committee looked at some of his colleagues and they said, well, we got a quarrel. So they moved the legislation to the top of the calendar for immediate consideration. So we voted on it and we got it out of the committee. And I knew that was a way to get it out. Lo and behold, the next thing, that Monday, that next morning, headlines of the clown letter uh, that uh, education bills uh, passed out of the committee. Uh, and when we got back to the education committee that day, one of my colleagues, happened to be from Philadelphia, Mississippi at that time, and a very good friend of mine until today, a white fellow, of course. Uh, but when he got back to the education committee today, he got up on a raw table like this, going around the room, stoned and, and, and screaming and hollering and stomping all those tables because that bill had passed out. And that was another high point of my career, uh, getting those bills passed out of the education committee. And I'll be fair, briefly, I'm from uh, and, the, <laughs> and the spring of 1982, uh, we had been, Governor William Winter was the government at the time, and uh, we had an education reform, for reform package, and uh, being chairman of the education committee, I always get my important bills out of the committee fast and get them to the council fast. Because we had a rule then where the rules committee uh, could meet and they could rearrange the calendar. You could work to get your bill to the top of the calendar, maybe about number five, should be number five the next day. But the rules committee would meet and they would kick your bill back to the heel of the calendar. Well, your bill is number five today your bill may be kicked back to maybe 110 tomorrow. It's got to work its way gradually back up the calendar. So that's what they did for us in the spring of the year, spring of 82. So I got the chairman of the, the vice chairman of the education committee, who happens to be the, he went on to become the mayor of Macomb after he left the legislature. Uh, and another uh, one of the individuals, he happens to be from of Vicksburg at the time. They were both uh, uh, Caucasian and individual. So I went to the speaker's office. I never uh, kept anything hide from Veteran He appointed me, uh, uh, you know, speaking I served at his will and pleasure. Uh, and, and before we, get, we got to that, and the, well, I went to Speaker Brother Newman's office and he had those two with me. And I said, Speaker Newman, I came here to let you know that I'm going to move that house bill, I gave the number, will be moved to the top of the calendar for immediate consideration. I said, you the speak, you, you the speaker of the house and, and I just want to let you know that. He said, I would not make that motion if I was you. Would speak, I'm going to make that motion. He said, some of these boys can't stand that heat. I said, Mr. Speaker, they're not supposed to be any boys in the legislature. They're supposed to be men. He said, well, if you make this uh, motion, I'm not going to recognize you. I said, well, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to make the motion, and I hope we still be free. So then when I said that, uh, my vice chairman said, well, Mr. Speaker, if you don't recognize him, 
I'm going to stand and make the motion. He said, well, I'm not going to recognize you. Uh, so we have a handshake and we left the speaker's office. So at the appropriate time, I stood. What does a gentleman, a gentleman from home wish to be uh, recognized for? I said, to make a motion, Mr. Speaker, will you state your motion? I stated my motion. Uh, out of order, you're not recognized. Then my vice chairman stood. What does the gentleman from Pike wish to be recognized for? He made the uh, offer the motion. Uh, out of order, you're not recognized. Then when I left the chamber of the Capitol, of the House of Representatives, to go and make a phone call and let the educator know what had happened, I heard all of the commotion and the soiree and et cetera. And when all that commotion came and the speaker could not get order, then somebody made a motion that we stand adjourned and was a few eyes and we came to know what the nose was like a lion roar. Uh, uh, but the Mr. Speaker wrapped the gavel in the house down the yard and he walked off the floor of the house. Uh, then I went by Governor William Winter's office and I told him, Governor Winter, uh, I don't know if I can put the individuals uh, on the education committee through this blood bath again. Uh, you know, if we cannot get some kind of support. And the individuals from Ottawa County, uh, they showed me literature by folks threatening to do to his wife and family while they inject the place of the legislature. Uh, individuals from the other county showing me a legislation where they're going to kick out the Sunday school class. Uh, individuals from Western Highlands County, white individuals, bringing me literature showing me what they're going to, what's going to happen to this family if they support it. So, uh, I advise them, William you want to, you need to uh, get some of the old line organizations, uh, uh, like Farm Bureau and some of the white organizations to support our efforts. And Governor Winter, I guess, took my advice and he took it to the road. And he called three of us, some uh, six members of the legislature, three senators and three legislators, uh, three members of the House of Representatives, to the government mentioned, and he says, I summon the six of you here not to ask you if I should call a special session or not, uh, but to let you know that I am going to call a press conference to you, and I will announce if I am going to convene a special session or not. And uh, that's what he asked us to do. Well, the lieutenant governor, he summoned the same six, three senators, uh, to his office, and the speaker summoned the same three legislators uh, to the lieutenant governor's office. So we met in the lieutenant governor's office and we had a, a healthy discussion. Those six members of the legislature, speaker of the house and the lieutenant governor. So I had said not one word, so I sat there. So finally the speaker called on me and said, Mr. Chairman, I see you might have quiet. What do you have to say? I said, uh, listen, well, they had made it, they had decided. It is by Constitution, if the little, when this uh, government calls a special session, uh, you've got to convene. But uh, constitutionally, you don't have to take up any bid. So they was going to convene and adjourn. That's what they're going to do. So when Mr. Speaker said, what do you have to say, Mr. Chairman? I said, Mr. Speaker, I said that you're well in place. You appointed me, and you can move me when you get ready. But when the governor calls a special session, if you have not removed me, I'm going to do everything within my power to get a bill out of that committee and get it passed the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. Then I turned to the lieutenant governor, and I said, Mr. Governor, it's going to look mighty good over there in that Senate. When we sort of bail over there, and ain't nobody over there but the news media <laughs> and those up the chair. <laughs> so then everything was quiet out of the mouth, and uh, that meeting was a job. So the special session was called, and uh, we got investment, we got a bail out of the committee. Uh, and the <laughs>
probably won't, most of the his, most historical accomplishments were made under your sixth presidency. Can you talk about the highlights of things that happened at Jackson State when you were president? Well, first, let me say that uh, I have a book full of in that in a briefcase there. Which was, <coughs> yeah, it's worth it. Now, with uh, my GSU experiences, there were many. But it would take a long time, probably longer than you to tell the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, then you just have to have a gallon sometimes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, however, uh, let me say this. Uh, when I first uh, became JSU uh, president, uh, uh, the governor called. Uh, presidents of uh, Jackson State, all and Valley, down to his office, Governor John Bell Williams. <laughs> and he said, now, I want y'all to stop y'all's people from all this marching and demonstrating out there. Now, I can handle these, these Peckerwoods, I know them, but I want y'all to stop y'all's people. <laughs> and so, President Boyd and, and uh, White kind of put the head down. I said, I'm the newcomer, you know. So, Governor, I said, uh, I plan to allow the Jackson State University uh, students to protest on campus. I plan to allow them. As a matter of fact, I plan to uh, uh, provide for them a place to demonstrate. Now, if they leave the campus, they will, that's your responsibility. Dr. Peters, I appreciate your frankness. <laughs> he said, I want your band to play in my inauguration. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll do that. The point was, uh, um, this was the first time a black band uh, did march in the inauguration. We had uh, Bob Davis, who was the band leader. Oh, and when we marched by the platform, he played Born Free. <laughs> <laughs> introduction there. But the point being that I went in letting it be clear where I was going to stand. Now, um, uh, actually, um, going before the college board is just no, you know, no experience. Prior to my being president, the presidents, the black presidents were not allowed, well, they, well, at least they didn't sit into the waiting room with the white presidents. They had to stand up in the hallway until called. Wow. But when I became president, I went and sat right down with those guys. <laughs> <laughs> and then I shook hands, and, but I didn't leave. And I, I stayed there. Mm. And so that kind of ended that. Um, they had a so-called President's Council. The white president had a council in which they would meet, and they would uh, um, recommend to the state legislature the needs of the schools, including ours. Mm. So uh, I uh, told the uh, commissioner who was really uh, Dr. Job at that time, I said, Dr. Job, I said, uh, frankly, uh, uh, what they are asking for is not what I'm asking for. So I would like them to uh, circulate uh, their recommendations to us to look at. Mm. You know, Dr. Peep, you know, they, they, you know uh, what they do doesn't really, it's not official. Mm. I said, but it goes before the legislature. I said, this president's council, we're not a member of. So uh, he said, well, you know, that's kind of a private group. But the, the board regulation said uh, that should be two councils. One, it just said two councils, really. It didn't say black or white. Mm -hmm. So we had the option as black presidents to organize a, a so-called president's council. But the uh, president's board and white said, young man, you're moving too fast. You're moving too fast. Uh, that's not the right thing to do. I said, okay, I'm going to apply for admission to the White Council. <laughs> so uh, I went to the uh, president, who at that time was the guy who was the president of, uh, of MUW. His name now. He's dead. He said, John, the time to ain't right. I mean, we would never get any money from the, from the legislature if they knew that we sat down with you guys. It's just not right. So uh, I tried to get the other guys to organize, they wouldn't. 
So the year passed, and the next year, the president of Mississippi State was, was the uh, chair. I went to him again. He said, John, just come on in. Mm -hmm. Just like you've been a member all about, just come on in. Mm -hmm. And he's telling the guys to come too. Well, they wouldn't come, but I went to the meeting that night at, at the board uh, uh, building down there, uh, eighth floor. And I went in and I just started accepting motions to be sure I was on record, you know. And, and uh, <laughs> I, anyway, and, uh, we actually, I became a member. The next day, President White called me and said, John, what happened? I said, nothing. I mean, I just went there and made a, a few seconds and so on. He said, man, you made, you made, me, you made me in danger. I said, no. If so, I, you know, I could go anywhere at that time. I, was, I had all kinds of contacts. But at any rate, they elected me the next year's President's Council Chair. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's some of the small things that happened that were going on. But it was always a fight. We got stuck in spite of the board. You see, the, 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 the college board is a regulator. They're not for anybody in particular. They tend to regulate. Now, the, uh, it turns out that there are individuals who are for individual schools, but it, in the main, they would regulate. And they tried to regulate Jackson State because we were always trying to move ahead. And I was controversial because I was always asking for new programs. See, we were basically a weak teacher's college. And I began to try to move into technology. And they fought me tooth and nail just to keep us being a teacher's college. Now, when I first uh, proposed to have uh, uh, industrial technology, which is really some basic stuff, you know, high junior college, you had 10 times what we were dreaming of. So uh, uh, I submitted my proposal in my, my board report, and uh, the, the so called commissioner thrashed, called for all corner and valleys. You always get something down here. He's going to take some more of your students. <laughs> <laughs> By that time, we had kind of double. We started off being about the same size as Alcorn, but we had kind of double twice as large, so they were worried about our growing too fast. At any rate, um, what happened is that um, Boykins, the president of uh, Valley, called me and said, John, what's going on? But the man told us to get something together right away and about some kind of technology. What was that all about? I said, look, all of us are going to go up there and fight for it. They're trying to keep us from having anything but just teacher education. It's okay, but we need to get beyond that. But when I got there, the guy had got to them. And so they turned against me and said, Y'all know what the teacher's college is. A, a, a wheelchair class of man, what are you talking about? I said, Valley doesn't have half the stuff that Hines Junior College has, and all corner, all the way is A and M. The A and M is nothing. Uh, you guys ought to be fighting with me. But they wouldn't, so. I finally got it, started off with so-called uh, industrial technology. But moving on up to what happened as we went on, I kept on uh, uh, asking for new degrees and advanced degrees, because when I first got aboard, we did not have a master program. We had just a, a salary program for principals. You had to be a working principal to be in the master's program. So we finally got to be a regular program. And, uh, and we, we kept on moving. There's too much to tell. It's in my book, really, but it's too much to tell about the details of it. But what happened is that we eventually got a, a full fledged master's degree program. And the next fight came to for the doctor's program. But let me tell you, along the way, uh, I had some other struggles. Uh, I knew Aaron Henry quite well, and so he was the uh, NAACP, uh, really, chef person at that time. So he said, John, I want you to speak to the uh, youth program that we're going to meet in Hattiesburg. I'd like you to speak to the young people. I said, okay. I didn't think too much of it. But uh, the, the, the black um, radio station picked it up. And all, every hour, Dr. John Peebles is speaking to NWCP. Mm. <laughs> Dr. John Peebles is to NWCP. <laughs> and I was driving down. Dr. John Peebles speaking up that guy down there. Now, I really spoke at some youth building. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to the main meeting. But when I got back, I got called down around by Dr. Thresh. <laughs> he had a fit on me. He said, you, you can't do stuff like that. You can't, you can't do that. I said, well, I just speak to the young people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, 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 but you speak to another SCP. So the board called a special meeting on me. <coughs> I said, oh boy, I might be fired. <laughs> 
But anyway, uh, when I got there, Mr. M. M. Roberts, who was a known segregationist, led that he's, he's got a people to, you mean to tell me that you, oh, no, they wanted to see a copy of my speech. In my speech, I had recommended that the, the young black kids will, will get more or better training education at the black schools for the time being, the way the situation is. So I was urging those kids to go to a black institution. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that board meeting, especially for me, Mr. Roberts said, Dr. Peoples, uh, I've been kind of worried about you uh, on the University of Chicago and stuff, but you mean to tell me that you believe that the Negro kids need to go to the Negro schools? <laughs> <laughs> I said, sir, for the time being, I believe they'll get a better education at the Negro, school, Negro schools. I said, Negro. <laughs> This don't man be the same thing I believe. <laughs> <laughs> Let y'all let him go. They've been farming that time. They got to later on. They've been farming that time. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just saying, uh, along the way, it was always a struggle against the odds uh, to try to build Jackson State. And uh, there were a lot of incidents that happened, even beyond this, that I could tell. Um, it, was, it was a matter of uh, trying to build the, uh, the academic thing. Like in this book, I talk about the academic struggle, which is in about three or four phases. And that was a matter of uh, trying to get teachers. At first, uh, you know, the, the rule was you could not hire any white teachers at Jackson State or uh, all Corner Valley. Mm -hmm. But you could hire the Asians, you know, um, <laughs> but you could not hire the, uh, the uh, so called uh, uh, white people. The, uh, what the name of them. But anyway, uh, 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 yeah. but anyway uh, I decided to, uh, well, first of all, I got in contact with a nunnery up in Wisconsin someplace. And, and there were a lot of nuns who wanted to come down here and worry just about for nothing. But uh, before that, uh, there was a, a white person who was a uh, he wasn't a priest, so what's the religious priest? He, 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 he. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he had the old miss, but he, he, he was a, 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 a Catholic. <laughs> so I hired him, and I didn't, I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't say what his, what his race was. Okay. But when he got down there, they saw it was white. And so they called me with me. I said, well, he went to Ole Miss. <laughs> and so that passed. So that the last time I said what the race was, but to, uh, in order to build Jackson State, at that time you could not find uh, any African Americans who had degrees in, say, chemistry or physics. Uh, that most of the education is hard to even find one in English who had a major English at that time. But this nunnery uh, had nuns who wanted to come down here and work. So I hired about five or six of them. So they came down and, and, uh, and boy, they, they just loved to teach. But the one came and said, Dr. Peebles, what do we do with this money? She said, well, we never had it. We always had to send the money back to the, to the nunnery. I said, well, you know, whatever you want to do with it. So uh, they, they made uh, scholarship, made our scholarships too. Because and, and, they finally began to uh, to keep the money. And they kept, they came after me. As a matter of fact, a couple of think married black men. It oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> took off their money. The point being is that we were able to, uh, to build up Jackson State's so faculty by various ways, and one was through, through bringing in nuns. A lot of people from uh, Asia, too. Kids used to complain that they couldn't understand what they were saying, but I said, well, they, they have their degrees, but you have to try to understand them. So that was another thing we had to do uh, to uh, build up the faculty. The other thing was just to overcome the, uh, the, college, the college board's opposition to us. Now, how we get this doctor's degree, we've been fighting for it for a long time, but uh, Ole Miss and Southern said that they were against it because they had programs here at the University Center and they felt that would undermine them. They would always be against us and vote us down. 
But Mississippi State always was always fighting. And Mississippi State wanted to get a degree, a PhD degree in forestry. Ole Miss was against it. So uh, the Ole Miss, uh, I mean, the Mississippi State president said, John, if you can get the, the two blacks on the board to vote with us, we will help you get your doctor's degree. <laughs> and so the day came for the vote, where they first voted for Mississippi State, and they got their degree. Then when it came up to mind, they went there about two or three hours, and, and nothing was happening. So finally they came out and said, people, all we can do for you is to, to get you a degree in early childhood. There's other stuff you're asking for, degrees, and it's just not going to pass. I said, well, okay, we've got to get our foot into the door, but once we get one degree, so that's how we got early childhood first. That's all we can get passed on that day. Now, uh, then came the, uh, the Ayers case. That was the big thing that the board fell out here about. In the Ayers case, um, uh, I was really in secret contact with the, with the lawyers who were uh, who, uh, for us. By the way, the, the, when the suit was filed, uh, the, the black presidents would not defend us. We would just go uh, Although the board made us pay, the board would take off the top of our appropriation the money to pay the lawyers uh, uh, who were fighting us. So we had to, to pay for the ones fighting against us, our, our moving ahead. But uh, what happened in the Ayers case, I kept on recommending that the University City in Jackson be a part of Jackson State's campus. And they tried to get me to take that off my recommendation. I said, well, sir, you can always disapprove it, but this is what I recommend. And I also asked for doctor's degrees, and uh, as you see coming here now, uh, engineering and so on. And, but um, I would never take it off. They tried to get me to take it off. So they said, you're not cooperating with us at this end of thing, doctor. They pointed the thing in my face and tried to make me take it off. I said, well, son, you can always disapprove it, but it's what I would recommend for Jackson State. So as you know, uh, uh, I went through uh, several sessions of trials in the Ayers case, and in the end, uh, after I was gone, uh, they uh, found a rule more or less in favor of the plaintiffs. Uh, I want to know well, what happened to you, Dr. Why did you have to leave? I didn't have to leave, they really fired me. <laughs> uh, what happened there was uh, I was rather stubborn in the Ayers case, so they notified me a year ahead of time and said, we're, At the end of this contract, we're not going to renew your, con your, your contract. I said, uh, any reason why? No, you've been a fine president, but you know, uh, you know, it's so much time, you suffer burnout. I said, burnout? I am about 50 years old, but burnout? <laughs> but anyway, they, they wanted to get rid of me, so I said, okay, uh, would you uh, allow me to announce it to my faculty of uh, uh, myself? They said, okay. But while I was, uh, in, in South America with the foundation, uh, they leaked it to the press. And my, my wife, of course, she said, uh, John, she said, you know the thing that we knew about and we're trying to wait until uh, Founders Day to announce it? It's all over the news uh, about your being dismissed at Jackson State. And they made up a reason that they said I had a, a deficit or something. I didn't have a deficit, of, frankly, you uh, they made me have one. What they did was to go way back to uh, my second year that, that, that dormitory, the New Men's dormitory, they said uh, you use state money to, to, to buy furniture. I, I, did, I, I, I didn't even have that. That was not by the building commission. Well, you, well, you should have you should have known about it. Anyway, they, they put that down. It's, and also, they, they just found other reasons to try to find some shortage. I said, well, okay. Uh, what we'll do for next year is to take off the top of my appropriation to cover that. But in the meantime, uh, of course, uh, I uh, left Jackson State and I was assigned as a distinguished professor at the University Center working for Mississippi State at the same salary. And uh, I was doing fine until they kept trying to control my research. They didn't want me to talk about anything black in the research. They wanted me to have some neutral stuff. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, I had to submit my research to Thrash for his approval. That's the so-called Commissioner Thrash for his approval. And he even tried to tell me to take this out. So I'm not taking that out. That's, that's, what, I, that's, what, that's my hypothesis and so on. 
At any rate, uh, I finally said, I'm going to retire. And so the board had a meeting on me. They wouldn't let me, they don't want me to retire. Why are you retiring? You got a, a nice office up here in the town, and, the, <laughs> and you got the same salary? I said, I just want to be free. <laughs> that was true. I, I just wanted to be free. I wanted to just be free and not want an impression on me. I thought here I was at that time. I was about to, uh, uh, murder, I was 62. I said, I just got to get out of here. I want to be free. So I counted my money and I, I can live. <laughs> I was just about tempted to take another job, but I turned it out. I could have gone to North Carolina or age, uh, North Carolina. That was some lost Central. 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 And uh, I said, no, I, I can never make another head of steam as I had at Jackson State. <coughs> so uh, I just decided to just stay here. And uh, I really had a ball. I mean, I had a ball in Jackson State. It was a fight all the way. But I would do the same thing again. Some people say the students 
demanded the Black Studies Institute. Mm -hmm. So, which one is correct? <laughs> 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 First of all, uh, let me say I would, I would in no way want to, to uh, diminish uh, Martha Walker's uh, status and, and her contribution to Jackson State. I first met her when I was a, a senior at Jackson State, and, uh, and I was a student by the president, and the kids kept talking about that mean teacher giving all of the ups. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, she didn't teach me because I was a senior, I had all my uh, English and so on. But when I came back, she was still here, and she was uh, um, writing a dissertation and <coughs> about to get her degree. And um, uh, she got her degree, and uh, about the time I became president, and, um, that's when I got to know her better. Now, uh, uh, actually, uh, along that time, there were a lot of so-called, uh, the so-called, I would say, the Black Student Revolution. And all over the, the country, in you know, the black institutions, some of the white institutions, you had a so-called black studies program. But what I wanted was not a so-called black studies thing. I wanted to be intellectual. So I call ours. I, I had the idea of the study of the history and culture of black people. Now, uh, uh, I actually uh, had that idea. So I sent for Margaret, Dr. Well, Dr. Walker, Eric Tamner, and uh, talk to him about it. That's just the kind of thing I'd like to do. Because his mother didn't like to work with him about me. She, she was very, very independent. And she, would, she would come and see me, and I'd give her a whole hour. She would talk with everybody and about how these people didn't, didn't believe in her. She had to go around with it, says, uh, um, to go down to the college board to get them to get support for to go to school, and then we had a, a Dr. Jefferson here who had his PhD, and um, he didn't want anyone else to get one. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at any rate, uh, uh, she had proved these people wrong. So, so she said, uh, uh, frankly, this is just the thing I want to do. I just cannot deal with these people. So uh, I don't care whose idea, the idea I had was someone to direct the program, which I would call a history of, of the, uh, the study of the history of the culture of black people. And we wanted to have uh, music, literature, history as a part of it. And so she agreed to direct the program. So uh, whether she was the founder or whatever, or whatever uh, that made me that different because of my job was to try to bring the best out of the folks who worked at Jackson State. I was not, I was a mathematician, but I wasn't teaching that. So I wanted the best out of her and all the professors. So I, I don't really care who says who was the founder. I, I have, the, the, the truth of the matter is um, when you're president, almost in every case when you appoint somebody to start something, they'll end up being the founder. But there have seven cases at Jackson State, people who never thought of that thing, but yeah. If they're the first person in this, they were the founder. Okay, the founder. Yeah. But I just want you to do the best you can. I hope I saw the question. Did you tell me you have a purple shirt? Okay. Uh, I concur with what you, your analogy said, Dr. Martin Walker had examined. Actually, I did a sculpture of her. So I did a psychoanalysis of her. <coughs> I did the sculpture. Also, did the painting of the uh, 17 elected official which uh, the uh, legislator is a member of the Dr. Clark. I don't know if you've seen this, it's a painting. I'm the uh, artist, Carol Dorsey, a bronze sculptor, et cetera. Uh, and I currently have an exhibit at Jackson State. My question is, uh, how did you get along with Dr. Mark Warren? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, I would give her, I would say to, to my secretary, let's, let's give her this whole two hours. So she would come in and, and she would talk with everybody. Uh, once we had a vacancy uh, as the English department head, she said, just, just let me be chair. Just for one month. I don't know. <laughs> just for one month so I can get these ends to <laughs> And 
as you go and talk about all these folks, what they've been doing and so on. I recall once we temporarily, uh, I believe we had a, a white person uh, who became the acting chair on the north, I believe. And so she came, she looked. I'd be done if I marched behind that woman in this commission. <laughs> okay, just go in there and sit down. You don't have to march. <laughs> but she was a uh, she was also a genuine person, and, and I, I loved her because of, uh, you know I knew her from the time we were in school. So I got along with her, but I did uh, allow her to you know express her genius. Uh, she wrote uh, for my inauguration of. Uh, Ode to the President, Ode to Johnny P. or something like that, but I forget the name of it, but, but she was very artistic, I mean, and, uh, very poetic. And so I just love her. So and I'd rather have a way up to a point. <laughs> <laughs> but I let her come in, just, she just came in, just vented herself, and, and I let her do that. She talked about really, she probably talked about me too, but not her thing. <laughs> so that's how I got along with her. Um, I saw Brandon. Brandon Taylor, Brandon, get your hand up, and then uh, I'll young lady's back. We'll back up. This is on Dr. People. Uh, during your time as president of Jackson State, can you like talk about the uh, relationship that Jackson State has with the Grace Jackson community? Mm -hmm. Repeat that one more time. Can you talk about the relationship that you ha uh, that Jackson State has with the uh, community of West Jackson during your time as president? Oh, well, of course. Uh, uh, at the time I came, uh, this was more of a thriving community. You didn't see all these vacant houses, you know. And a lot of our students came from South Jackson, I mean, this whole area. All down here, you had uh, homes, you know, and these people commuted back and forth. Now, uh, we did have what we call the corner boys who would just come to the school and uh, just to watch the football players and watch the girls. And, and we had those several disturbances. And when they, whenever that happened, they would come on campus and meet with the kids, and you can tell them apart. Um, we had, as you probably have heard, this in my book too, about uh, we had uh, student disturbances in 67, 68, 69, and 70. And there had been one before I came, really. So uh, whenever those things happened, the, the students would come to us, Lake Street, which was through Street at that time, and they would throw rocks and bricks at any white persons passing through. And so we didn't want that to happen. So whenever we found someone who had done that, if we knew the person, we would give them suspensions. Now we're not trying to do, don't do stuff like that, but they did, they, they invented the anger, and they maybe, I'm sure they had some reasons to be angry. angry. But, um, so far as how we related to the whole community, but at that time, uh, uh, the community was, was really uh, beyond the um, street now. Uh, it was a white community all around us. And uh, the middle class blacks lived, lived uh, over on, uh, not too far away. Uh, so there was no bad relationship. It was just a matter of uh, uh, our trying to give the students a chance to be educated and we've got grants of all kinds of people who were real well. There are many of these people now whose parents were well, they are now doctors and lawyers. Um, the, your young lady, I'll look back. I would like to say that you too to I didn't quite follow your question. You said John. What are, what are, what are your thoughts on? Come on, come on, she, on close. I can't. She asked, "What were your thoughts on what? the current status of education in Mississippi concerning the charter schools and right. so forth?" Okay. She asked about um, your thoughts on the current state of education in Mississippi. Um, some of the different things that are happening, including charter schools. Well, first of all. Uh, 
I don't know much about the charter school thing myself. I don't have a dog in that fight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> As far as what things are going on in, in, the, in this in this uh, in the state, uh, it's a whole new ball game. We have uh, black superintendents, um, like in the city of Jackson. Here we have a black super school superintendent. Almost all of the principals are uh, African American. So uh, we're doing our own thing now. How well we're doing, I'm not sure, but um, it would be well if uh, we could score higher on uh, the test. I used to tell my kids, look. They think we're out here doing nothing, playing school. Let's fool them. Let's really get an education, okay? <laughs> now you guys can go and protest if you want to in the library, and, and let's let those people downtown uh, know that we're really out here getting an education and not out here just clowning. So uh, on a statewide basis, uh, uh, it's a shame that Mississippi always falls low as a whole. And some people say because of all these black people making these low scores, it, it, it used to be um, a concern of mine that um, we had to, you know, have compensatory efforts to have our kids to make high scores on these so-called standardized tests. I was on the board of directors of ACE, um, uh, not ACE, I mean um, ACT, and uh, we had them to come here and, and to have our teachers and seminars to help us in test taking so we can make higher scores. And uh, I guess Mississippi has a long ways to go. Uh, the charter schools, I don't know what they do, but I hope they'll emphasize that these the three R's, the so-called core, core uh, group of the, the core. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, that's more or less the three R's. And so I was, you may want to talk about that. <laughs> As, as I understand the question, the question is on charter schools. Okay, in my opinion, charter schools is not needed in Mississippi. In my opinion, not Jackson State's opinion, charter schools is another way to go back to segregation from whence we came. Being an, <clears throat> being an educator, we do not need charter schools. We need individuals who is going to teach in the classroom. Now, I have said for some time in the legislature, if you go to a plant, a factory, there's someone going to know what's going on on every line in that factory. Then when you come to the classroom, there should be someone that know what's going on in the classroom. But back during my time, when I was in the classroom, the principal, he had to go to the classroom to see. But I understand now, someone can sit in their office and they can know what's going on in the classroom. And that's what we need, is the supervisor of instruction. Now, if I was in the legislature today, I introduced some wild legislation, some legislation that you may call off the wall, but I would introduce legislation that we revamp the present structure of high school. That we would do away with the so-called principals in high school. Uh, that we would have a high school administrator. That high school administrator uh, would take care of the physical uh, plant, take care of the school buses, and take care of the upkeep of the ground and, and everything else. But then you would have a supervisor of instruction. That supervisor of instruction would be able to hire and fire the faculty. That supervisor of instruction would know what's going on in the classroom. Now, if it takes that for somebody to stand over somebody's head to know what's going on in the classroom, I'm speaking from experience. I have seen teachers in the high schools of the state of Mississippi not teaching and not doing a single thing. First of all, I would fault the teacher for doing that. Then I would fault the principal for allowing that to happen. Uh, but the education has changed so much until a principal cannot do all of the things that he or she is supposed to do. But are charter schools needed in Mississippi today? If someone wants charter schools, you have them. 
Do they need to take place of public schools in Mississippi? No, no, no. That is a way to go back to desegregation. Uh, and it must be uh, contested, and the truth must be brought to light. Now that is Robert Clark's opinion of charter schools. Being one month new in the division of this um, what do you see from an education standpoint as Jackson State's next mission or next time? And how can students, faculty, staff go <coughs> above that, both from an education standpoint and the legislative standpoint? <coughs> next next battle for Jackson State to move forward. And how can we be supported by the current faculty and staff? I have a policy more or less to not. To not evaluate or criticize uh, my successors because uh, I came in and did my own thing. You know, it's just a lonely job, and you can't have any friends, and the ones who you think admire you really hate you. That's just the truth, and so uh, I know that the one in office has had hard enough time without uh, one of her uh, former president coming in and trying to say what should be done. Now, frankly, uh, I'm on the board of directors of the Alumni Association, and I, I just, I believe, better there so go with some of them. Uh, I've got three or four people running for president, and they've been trying to get me to take sides. I said, look, I'm going to be a source of wisdom for whoever wins. And uh, I don't want to be on any one particular side. We have, we have three strong women uh, running for president of Jackson State's Alumni Association. So um, I think that Jackson State is moving ahead the way I had hoped it would move. Um, my feeling is that Jackson State would be a major university in the city of Jackson serving all the people in the regards of race. That's what I told the board when I first came aboard. That's what I planned to do. And so it's moving in that direction. And those are groups that I insist to stay on that air's agenda, it's, 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 it's unfolding. I mean, they said we'd never get a degree in engineering because that's Mississippi State. We got it. And, and these buildings that they said, uh, they should tell me, Dr. Peoples, you, uh, you're too ambitious for Jackson State. You got too much uh, decoration on those buildings. You're, you're, you get more classroom space if you take some of that uh, concrete stuff off that's what sort of our kids need to be proud of that thing the same as all this. So uh, I'm proud of Jackson State and I support whoever was the president. And now I don't go around trying to meddle. If they ask me for information for advice, I'll try to give it, but I won't try to offer it before they ask for it. So uh, I'm a supporter of Jackson State, whoever was the president. It was nothing in the curriculum. It, it, it was or a part of the work. Yeah. 
Why not take it away? Yeah. I took it away because it, it, it was really causing the students to be suspended for no good reason. There were no student girls were hiding on the bed and all that kind of stuff trying to avoid it. <coughs> and the, the, uh, the football boys were required to go because they had a scholarship. So they'd come in, some of them would, would uh, have just a t-shirt with a tie, but they didn't have a tie. Some would have a, a tie just wrapped around the neck. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, it was not that I was not a religious person, and I don't know if I am or not, but my point was, I wanted the students to be with us in this fight, and not against us. And I just did not see having students being suspended or expelled for not going to sign the best person. So what we did was to allow them to go to the local churches and allow the students to start a religious movement on the campus. And they would go out in the city and bring in some of these kids. They started a Sunday school for the, for the local, local children. And they had their own religious stuff, organization. They had a, a, a student, a student a gospel choir that was so good until the, uh, the choir director got mad and said they were upstaging them. <laughs> But anyway, uh, that's what I did that. I don't know if that's... Okay, so how do you think it affected Jackson State, the campus of Jackson State as a whole, when you took it away? Do you think it had an effect on the students and the behavior of the students and the type of students that were attracted to the college? Oh, yes. Uh, I would say that uh, the students not having to to be against us or uh, uh, hating to, uh, to go, because the ones who were going, they were not happy. They were really unhappy, <laughs> unhappy going. Right. In fact, it was a continuous fight uh, against the administration for making them go to church. And, and they didn't want to go. You had to dress up, have a tie on, the girls had to dress up. And uh, frankly, uh, I think it was a good move. And it, 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 it did bring to the students because it was, it was not a matter of religion, it was a matter of uh, they having some freedom of religion. They didn't stop being religious, they just didn't have to go to a church on a Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Right. <coughs> so they, they uh, were happy with it, and I was happy with it. I'm glad I did it. Yeah. <laughs> um, because it is now almost 8 o'clock, I imagine as a facilitator that I should ask everybody in here to thank our presenters.